Hi everyone, my name's Alana. I'm one of the moderators from Limwood. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Um, we've got um, people busy joining, so we'll just give it to 12 and then we'll get started. If I could ask for a few bits of housekeeping, um, if you feel comfortable, it would be great if you were happy to turn your cameras on. It's really nice for us to see your smiling faces. And if you um, could also add the city to your name so that we know where you are. And if you have, um, do not actually have your name, but just have a funny device or iPad and you wanna actually put your name, again, that would be great just to try make this as connected and community feeling as possible under the circumstances. Um, it's not yet 12, so we will wait one or two minutes before we officially get started, but welcome. We're happy to have you here with us. All right, um, it's just gone 12, so we are gonna ignore Jewish Mean Time and actually get started. Um, so welcome everyone to Linwood Oz 2020. Um, like I said, for the people that were here from the very start, my name is Alana. I am your Zoom moderator for today. I am going to hand over very, very quickly to the people that you've actually come to hear from, being Adam and Jared, who are going to be talking on a really fascinating topic. Just a few small housekeeping things. Like I said, if you are comfortable to have your camera on, that would be wonderful. Um, this session is being recorded so if you do not want to be recorded then please do not have your camera on. Um, for questions can you please direct them directly to Adam in the chat function and then the last two important things are if you are in this session and have not yet actually purchased a ticket to Linwood um, can I please ask that you do so? I will put the link into the chat in a second. Um, this is a fabulous volunteer-run organisation and relies on the good faith and honesty of people purchasing tickets. Um, and the last thing I will do before handing over is I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and New Zealand and pay respect to elders past and present. And without further ado, I am going to hand over to Adam. Thank you so much, Alana. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to today's session. It is my extreme honour uh, to interview and speak with uh, a dear friend of mine uh, who you're all here to hear from, who you're all listening to hear from or watching to hear from, if you've got your earpods in or if you're on your morning walk and, and you're listening. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Jared Ryan Davis. Um, as I said, a really good friend of mine. Uh, someone whose story, I think, resonates with a lot of people in the Jewish LGBT community. And if you're thinking, oh my goodness, there's a Jewish LGBT community, uh, you'd be right. We all catch up for, for breakfast every week and we talk about all of all of our parents and all the bobbies at, at shul that pinch our cheeks and say, marriage equality is legal now, so why aren't you married yet? I've got a grandson. Um, but anyway, I'm going to turn it, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Jared. Um, Jared, your story is is incredible and we're going to unpack it over the next hour. Do you perhaps want to start off for those who may not know who you are? Do you want to give us the rundown, the, the elevator pitch? Who is Jared Ryan Davis? Oh my goodness. Uh, who is Jared Ryan Davis? Well, I am 26. I was born in Perth. Um, uh, cis white male um, for those who uh, that is meaningful for um, and I went to a modern orthodox school growing up Carmel school uh, you know I, I celebrated all the festivals growing up I had a wonderful Jewish life um, sang in the choir every week with my dad as you do I, uh, I did the uh, I did Manish Dana for 22 years straight because I was always the youngest <laughs> Um, you know, it was, it was a good life. And we're, we're really lucky that he lives now here in Melbourne. We've converted another Jewish per person to come to, to come to Melbourne, which is always great. 
Um, I think all three of us were born in Melbourne, so uh, or live in Melbourne now. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, that'd be an interesting poll to see how many people are from Melbourne. It looks like there's quite a few from Melbourne and a couple from Sydney, but don't worry, there's still time to come down to Melbourne. Um, <laughs> Not too late, Jared. Jared, um, yes. you, you said that that well, I mean, obviously, born and raised Jewish, went to Carmel. What was life like for you? Was your family? Uh, conservative, orthodox, what was your upbringing like with your family? Uh, I mean, well, we, we didn't celebrate everything, you know, in, in our household, it wasn't about, you know, ticking every mitzvah box and, and doing everything to the letter. We, we lived, um, you know, we, we lived a, a good Jewish life, you know, we, um, we engaged with, you know, modern culture and society, but Judaism was always a core part of our lives. And we, we had those, uh, you know, every time we went to shul, it was like another, you know, another reminder of the core values and morals and stories that we can take with us through the next week to help us navigate situations. Um, so you weren't just going because scotch is kosher and that was something to look forward to after the... Come on, let's after. be real. Most people go for the kiddush. But, but Even well, more so when there's a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah on. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You <laughs> throw the lollies and then all the kids rummage around picking them all up and keeping them all for yourselves, as you do. Um, you know, I, I didn't really think about it too much because it's the only life I ever knew, you know? I, I have a sample size of one, so it's not like I can do research on what everybody's childhood was like. Uh, but um, whatever it was like, I, I like to look back fondly. I don't think it's good to spend your brain space thinking about negative memories. I like to think about the positives. That's that's very, I mean, that's a very, very good piece of advice. Um, but obviously something along the way happened to you where you kind of felt like something wasn't right or something wasn't normal. Well, yes. So the strange thing is you, you fall in love with your religion and all, and your entire uh, support network becomes your shul and your, your friends and, you know, and Judaism isn't just a religion. It's a language, it's a culture, it's, it's a cuisine, it's a type of humor, it's music, you know? And so when I started to realize that I was a little bit different, when I started to uh, find myself having and I didn't even have the language to describe it at the time. But when I discovered later that I was actually gay, when I, when I, had, when I was attracted to uh, men, um, I realized in that moment that what had, th that Judaism, which had previously been such a support and a comfort and uh, a, a mishpocha for me, that very same institution was now, um, this source of a lot of trauma for me um, because, you know, as, as we all know in, in the Torah, in the Torah, it teaches us that if you sleep with another man, it will, essentially it, it says um, the inclination is okay, but um, having a gay sex or having a, living a gay lifestyle proudly, that is not so great. So uh, I, I, when I was 12 and I realized I was gay, you know, that wasn't a particularly great moment. Um, and, I've, and it took a long time to sort of navigate that. It, 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 it creates an internal conflict because something that you can't control and something that is an integral part of you is in direct conflict with something that has your entire life given you so much love. And... Uh, it's 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 a tough position to be in. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Twelve is a really young age to realize something. Was it was it something that you recognized immediately, or was it something that you pushed to the back of your mind and said, "I you know I don't believe it. It's probably just a phase. Maybe I'm seeing guys come out of the gym looking very svelte and and handsome, and you know you that's how I, I went feel." To the gym when I was twelve. <laughs> Oh, well, you never know. You Pre could have been you, you could you, know, <laughs> you could have been swimming at an aquatic center. Um, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, who knows? Uh, but you know, what was it? Was it, what, at first did you go? Oh my goodness, this is me. Or 
or was it a bit of like a no i don't think it can be true well just on on the uh, the gym for a second uh, after i realized i was gay and i was still like you know i was finishing school um there, there were lots of so I'll, I'll say this when you are gay and you have to hide it the concepts of desire and disgust sort of become jumbled up in your brain and it, you know whenever you have a desire or you have a thought or you have a feeling you immediately have to push it down and it sort of messes with your brain quite a bit. Um, and I remember being in, in gym class, you know, in the changing rooms and we were all getting changed to go to snorkeling or whatever it was. And I had I actually had panic attacks. I used to have anxiety attacks in the changing room, um, you know, because I was, I was terrified of what my body might've done without, you know, my brain can say, push it down, but my body is my body. So I just turned around and got changed as fast as I could. Um, what was your question again? Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, no, I think you pretty much pretty much answered it. What was it like? You know, was it a gradual realization, or did you kind of suppress it and say, "No, this can't be true"? Uh, well, I remember when when I was twelve and I was sort of really struggling. Uh, I used to stay awake at until four in the morning every night. And uh, I know this is, we're trying to keep it light, but let's go into this space for a second. Um, you know, I, I have a very vivid memory of this. I used to stare at the ceiling, praying to God to take it all away, you know, um, feeling a lot of shame. And, you know, every time I, I let my, I don't want to get too graphic, but every time I, I let my, my thoughts and my feelings be physically realized by myself, uh, I immediately felt a lot of shame and a lot of panic afterwards. Um, and I used to tell myself, you know, I, I'll never find happiness. I don't deserve happiness. Um, it's like, you know, it, it's like, um, it's like being, a, the only thing I can say is it's like being a criminal. You know, let's say you've committed a crime and you constantly feel like one day the police will knock on the door and take you away. And you have to keep this secret. You have to keep it hidden. Um, and uh, that's, that's really sad. And look, I know that, that, um, when I was growing up, um, homosexuality was at least legal. And I, I you know, I, I know that people have had it a lot worse than me, but I can only speak from my personal experience. Um, coming to terms with your sexuality, was there anyone that, that you reached out to? I mean, your, your parents, uh, other members of the shul, did you have anyone that you could go to for support? Um, Maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no, but myself at that time, I thought the answer was no. Um, I, you know, if you have a dirty little secret, you don't want people to find out. You just want it to go away. You know, you don't want to, to confess to people that you have. And, like, you know, I, I've, I've progressed since then, but bear in mind at the time, my relationship with homosexuality was based on what was told to me by authority figures, by, you know, um, you know, in, in our parents' generation, homosexuality was illegal. So of course, our parents are going to have a particular relationship to it. Um, and when I, when I did uh, come out to my parents, um, you know, I was still really struggling at the time. So I probably wasn't as, as, uh, as I guess, mature with the conversation as I, I would have liked to have been looking back. And I think, um, you know, it, it took me a long time to even feel okay saying the words, I am gay without physically wanting to vomit. And, uh, and I, I asked my parents, I asked so much of my parents when I came out to them, I asked them to, you know, with a click of my fingers, almost say goodbye to the Jared that they had grown up with, that they had always known and the life that they had always planned for me. And they had to fall in love with this new person you know, and I asked so much of them and uh, they, they've been incredible. And I, 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 every time a queer person like myself comes out, you know, I think that coming out is one half of a two-way process. The other half is inviting them in. I know that we've all been through so much trauma and so much stuff in our lives, but I, I do think it is important to to create a space that is safe enough and welcoming enough and uh, empathetic enough 
to welcome them in. And if we are asking someone to, to go out of their comfort zone to accept us and to understand us, I think it's imperative that we go out of our way to understand the, 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 um, the views and the culture that led them to those views that they have. Um, well, thank you for, thank you for your honesty um, in that answer. Um, I know personal experience being, being gay in the, in the Jewish community does bring up a lot of questions um, and a lot of thoughts, some of it not so good and some of it good. Um, I guess I want to bring things back to a lighter mood. Um, yes. when, did, when did things kind of change for you? And if you have to be honest and say that when you moved to Melbourne and you met me as a friend, you know, then, then that's completely fine. Yeah, um, in some ways, I was <laughs> crawling through the darkness and then I met Adam and suddenly, it's like in The Wizard of Oz, when I suddenly arrived in Kansas and then Adam... Colored. Actually, true story. The way that we met, uh, there's a Jewish, um, a Jewish Facebook group, um, which is uh, just a lot of um, gay guys, gay Jewish guys in Melbourne. Uh, and I was doing comedy festival a couple of years ago. Um, and Jared was part of the group and he goes, I've got no way of getting there. So uh, me being the actual comedian that had to perform, picked up Jared to take him to a performance to watch me perform and then to drop him home afterwards. I felt I felt like I was I was rent a crowd. I was bringing rent a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I was your groupie for the night. What can I say? You were. Um, <laughs> but no, okay. Getting back on track. Um, yeah. When did things start to change for That's you, cool. or yeah. I, I guess when did when did you start looking at this positively, and saying, you know what, I'm gay. I'm Jewish. What am I going to do? Well, to add a little bit of context, because we can only talk about the the. The, the epiphany, if we first talk about what led to that epiphany. So sure. the end of high school, I was doing religion and life class. Um, we were basically taught that, you know, homosexuality is on par with kleptomania and all this sort of stuff. And I realized I had to make a choice. You know, I had to either be Jewish or I had to be gay. Um, I ended up choosing neither. <laughs> I ended up pushing away from Judaism quite strongly and I ended up essentially becoming asexual. I, I removed myself from any sort of sexual desire. I pushed everything away. Really? Um, sorry? I said, really? Yes, yes, really, yeah. Um, my first kiss was when I was 19, I think. Um, second year, yeah, it was after I came out publicly on Facebook. Yeah, I came out publicly on Facebook um, because I wanted to, I, well, I remember I, to answer your question, I, I went to um, Perth Pride Parade, um, the first vaguely Jewish thing I'd done in, in a number of years with the, with the Jewish um, cohort. And I saw everybody so, you know, smiling and dancing and laughing and being free. And I, I was really, really struggling at that point. And I thought, you know, something, something's got to give, you know, if I don't make a choice, then a choice will be made for me. And maybe it'll be in a choice I can't take back. So I decided a few weeks later to, to come out on Facebook, which was freaking terrifying. I kept um, redrafting what I wanted to post. And I get like, one of them was really funny. One of them was really like serious. One of them was just like, I'm gay. Um, Nothing in like short shorts and glitter and your hair done no, with a unicorn hat. That's not <laughs> it's, look, I don't okay, believe you. Okay. There are lots of people <laughs> in the world who they think of gay. They think of short shorts. They think of glitter. I just want to say like at the core, at, at the core definition, all that being gay means is that I have a warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart when I see a man instead of a woman. That's all it means. The music you like, the clothing you wear, the, the mannerisms you have, that's all culturally uh, associated stuff, you know, and, uh, and so I just want to say that, you know, you can, if, you know, you can be Jewish and live whatever kind of Jewish life you want. If, if you have, a, if you're gay, you can live whatever kind of life you want. And there's no obligation to fit into a, a category, I think. Um, yeah, right. So, so I came out, um, it was, you know, it was fine. You know, some people saw it, some people didn't. Then I went to Tuglit, Birthright, 2016. I was 22, I think. 
um, and we were all, uh, you know, underneath the stars in the Negev desert. We were all, we all had a quiet meditative moment. And uh, when we all came back, I, I forced myself, I closed my eyes and I forced myself to talk a bit about the moment I realized I was gay when I was 12 and all the feelings and all the, the anxieties and all, all of that. I shared that with the people on the group. And this was maybe the second last night. So I really felt at that point that I, it was a safe enough space to talk about that. And uh, that really made me, that was the second sort of moment that made me realize, you know, I can't change being gay. I, you know, I've tried, I can't, well, I didn't really try, but I wish I could have tried. Mm -hmm. Can't change it. I still have a choice how much Judaism to keep in my life. So I'm going to make the choice to keep holding on, to, to keep trying. Um, and then that led to last year where I was uh, invited to go to Argentina for a Jewish queer trip run by JDC Entwine, um, which is an incredible youth leadership organization. Check them out. Uh, and, you know, there the moment that stands out, you know, there were people from all around the world, some of them Jewish and struggling with their queer identity, others queer and struggling with their Jewish identity, but there we were, you know, on the edge of the world, um, at least compared to, to, to Melbourne. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Argentinians would say it's not the edge of the world, it's definitely home. It's a beautiful place. Um, but there we were, you know, almost sharing our cultural values with each other, you know, um, and the moment that stands out to me, uh, so Saturday morning, we all went to Buenos Aires Pride Parade together, all dancing and singing and being together proudly under the, the rainbow Jewish flag. Um, just fully being ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. And then in the nighttime, we congregated on the roof of our hotel room uh, to say goodbye to Shabbat. And some of us had never done Havdalah in our entire lives, but there we were, arm in arm, singing And uh, I don't know, it, it, it felt like our Jewish and our queer ancestors were calling out to us, you know? It, they fought and suffered and died for us to even have a chance to be in that moment. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I've never felt more Jewish or more gay in my entire life. I think that if so, that experience really demonstrated to me that Jewish people and queer people, we have so much in common. You know, our, our narratives are ones of struggle and trauma and survival and resilience. And we know what it's like to be to be in, to have those feelings and to be in that moment and to have, you know, to start to question yourself. Um, and so when I came back to Melbourne, I realized that I'm doing okay. You know, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent yet, but I'm doing okay. But there are so many people out there in the world who are Jewish and in the closet and really struggling. And there are others who are queer Maybe they've abandoned Judaism. Maybe they've been burnt by Judaism really badly, but they still have a core desire to hold on because when they were a child, it was the source of so much love and so much joy in their lives. Um, yeah. So I've, I've spent the last year or so trying to build that bridge between our two very similar communities. Um, one, one thing that really resonates is that some people, you know, some people go to shul every week, others don't. Um, sometimes it's a case of, you know, something happens in your life that brings you back. And you're right when you say, you know, there's, everyone practices Judaism at different levels and everyone has, um, I guess, a different perception of what Judaism means to them, whether or not they're questioning their sexuality, whether or not they're questioning their life choices, whether it's something's happened in their life that makes them question. Um, I always say though, you know, if you ever, if you ever have negative thoughts um, and you need to, um, uh, you know, you need to ask someone, always take the negative thoughts to a rabbi because then they'll sit down and they'll tell you, you know, they'll give you the realistic answer. <laughs> you know, in some reckon, ways, which I was recommend a few. It's just three Hail Marys. Hey, you're good again. Yeah. <laughs> take a shot of wine and off you go. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or in our case, take some, you know, when the, when the rabbi offers you scotch, never say no. And when the rabbis, you know, when the, um, uh, what, what's, uh, I've just forgotten the name. Um, anyway, move on from there. Yeah. Um, speaking about rabbis for a second, you know, I, I was recently asked, I was recently speaking with a, with a, a Chabad person actually about this. And they asked me, who do I blame? You know, they said, it's, it's obvious you've been through a lot in your life. Who do you blame? Do you blame me? Who do you blame? And I said to them, I don't blame anyone. I have no hate in my heart for anybody. You know, I, you know, as I said, it's before, true. It's true. You could really get on Jared's nerves and he'd still, he'd still give you a hug and say, I love you. Hey, call it a, <laughs> a strength or a weakness. That's how I am. Um, but, uh, you know, the, as I said before, you know, people have their views and have their values and have their beliefs based on what has been given to them through culture and through the authority figures that they trust in and that yeah. they respect in their lives. You know, and, uh, and maybe someone has a view that has a negative impact on my life. But I know, like, let's say that someone says, Jared, you know, stop living this lifestyle because X, Y, or whatever it is. You know, I have to remind myself that the core of the value that what's driving them to say that and what's driving them to do that is a desire for me to live my best life. The intention is for me to, to be the best person that I can be. And maybe the, the, uh, the, uh, the way that that manifests itself is by quite negative um, uh, uh, discourse. But I always have to remind myself that, that the person is genuinely has, albeit a misguided, but a genuine desire to improve the lives of all of us, bringing us towards heaven or helping us live our best life, whatever it is. And I also have to remind myself that, so there's a metaphor I like to use, which is, let's say that God is the CEO of Jewish corporation. And let's say that a rabbi is the customer service agent. And this is actually, this metaphor has been approved by by a rabbi, so I'm, I'm okay using it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a rabbi, it's got the seal of approval, the, the K on the side. Um, so, you know, let's say that you're a Telstra customer and, you know, you're not having great service and you, you're really frustrated, so you walk into the, the, the local retail store and you, you throw your phone down and you say, you know, I'm having a really terrible time, you know, make this better for me. You know, that, that customer service agent may agree with you. They may feel sympathy for you. They may think that the company has a few uh, uh, policies. But at the end of the day, they've signed that contract. They have a script mm. or a scripture to follow. And uh, they can only give the answer that, that, that allows them to say. And if they do decide to sort of go off the beaten track and give a sort of different interpretation, then maybe they'll get into, maybe they won't be as, they, maybe they won't have the same status within the organization. You know, so for that, um, for that reason, I, you know, I, I, I can't hate the face of an organization. You know, uh, it's the brain that, of an organization that makes the decisions. And I can never, I'll never be able to go to the CEO of Telstra and chat to him face to face, chat to him or her face to face about, um, about the policies. I can only talk to the face, but I can't hate the face. Good point. Very good point. Um, before we move on, I just want to go back. Um, like to bring your parents into this. Yes. If that's okay. They're physically here. This is like, this is your life. Yes. Here they, no, just kidding. I've they're got a palm you? tree. I've got a plant, plant next to me. Oh, my um, parents turned into a plant. <laughs> <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> I turned you, that's how Harry Potter style I am. Um, what, what, how old were you when you actually came out to your parents and what was their initial reaction? Oh man. Okay. So I'll, I'll say this. Uh, okay. I'll say this. I didn't so much come out to my parents as, um, I didn't realize how internet history worked. So, uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fill in the gaps, everyone. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my, my, I ended up having a conversation with my parents. Um, 
you know, as I said before, you know, I, I look back on this moment with, with empathy for what my parents, particularly my mum, was going through. You know, I, I think it's impossible for someone to carry a child inside of their stomach for nine months without starting to plan what life they might be able to have or, mm. you know, um, uh, you know, creating a, uh, creating a life for them in, in, in your mind. And, and when I came out to my mum, to my parents, but particularly my mum, she felt like there was, there was a death almost of the, the person that she had raised inside of her and the person she'd brought up. You know, she, she felt that um, my life would never be the same. She felt my life would be harder. Um, you know, uh, maybe she even knew, maybe she suspected when I was younger, but she wanted to sort of, you know, I have a vague memory of, of chatting to my mum about being a, being a, attracted to a guy. And, and I, I remember that she said with the best of intentions, you know, it's not because you're attracted to them. It's because you empathize with them. You empathize with their muscles and you, you want to look like them. And uh, so, you know, my, my mum really tried her best to, for me to have the best, safest life I could. Um, so when we did have that, that finite, uh, sorry, that, that final conversation, that sort of concrete discussion, um, yeah, she was, it, it took her a bit of time to, to get over, to, to get through that. Um, and, and, you know, when she did, she did feel sad that in some ways the family tree would, would be ending with me. Um, but the way I see it, you know, maybe, maybe in our family tree, my branch has fallen off and maybe it's fallen onto the ground, but maybe just maybe it started to blossom and flowers and fruit have now blossomed from this little stalk from the ground. And, I will never be able to complete that family tree, but I can start my own. Like I, I, I like your choice of words when you said your mum didn't, your mum was hoping that, you know, that being gay wouldn't give you a hard life. So it wasn't that your mum stopped loving you or didn't love you. She was obviously concerned about the, I'm an adult. I know what the world is, what the world is like and what people can hurl at you. I mean, you just need to look at social media, just go on to JSeq and someone asks for the number of, of some product or some person. And it turns out to a whole, it turns out to a war, you know, people on, you know, what people in the world can sometimes be, I guess, not, not as nice. I'll, I'll give you a key example. Um, so la, a few days ago, I arranged a, a pride Shabbat for people all around the world. And the intention was to create a really beautiful space where, where Jewish and where, where Jewish queer people could could meet and be together and, and share and grow. And uh, the actual event was incredible. And I'm actually doing another one in a few weeks. But at the beginning, it was actually hijacked by a coordinated effort of um, hackers, which was not pleasant. It's, it was images and sound you don't particularly want to hear. Um, so, yeah every for every good person in the world there's always going to be a bad person but the bad people just remind us and 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 help us to to see how wonderful the good people actually are so i'm i'm every time i have a negative experience uh it it makes me treasure how good the good moments really are yeah right and how's your relationship with your parents these days yeah, they're good. They actually came to the Zoom event and they were embarrassing me as parents have a right to do. So it's my belief that if parents pay for their kids' education and their food and their clothing, you know, I, I think parents have earned the right to embarrass their kids once in a while. <laughs> Nothing, nothing's ever stopped a good old, good old guilt. I'm actually just scrolling through the participant list now to see if your mum or dad is watching. They may be behind a name like iPad. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were um, really early for. for what does? Really happy. Yeah. Well, yes, because they're over in Perth, aren't they? This is very true. Nine nine. What is it? Nine thirty in the morning over there. Oh, they'll be up. Your dad will probably be be up already. Um, yeah. 
what do, I, I want to ask this as a question, not as a negative, but what does your family feel of you come a coming out publicly on Facebook and then doing things like this, like publicly sharing your, your story. Um, for those that may not have known or don't follow Jared on Facebook, um, you were actually on a very interesting um, episode on SBS about dealing with, with sexuality and religion. And you were there talking about what we're talking about now. How does your parents feel about you being so open and public? Because I know that there, I know through some experiences with friends of ours through the Jewish community, it's it's kind of like you know that's nice, but you don't need to, you know, you don't need to advertise it, put on a billboard, and and you know wave pom poms in the air, and off we go. Well, look, uh, if I had my way in my dream life, I would be able to live my private Jewish life with my husband and my family. I could just slip into the background. No one would bat an eyelid if I held my partner's hand in public. No one would question or I wouldn't have to justify or any of that stuff. But that's not the life I've been given. You know, if I kiss my partner in public, that is by definition a political statement. You know, just by existing as a gay man in Jewish spaces or as a Jewish man in gay spaces, I am an activist. I am making a political statement. Um, and I think... Do you if, feel that way, though? Well, it doesn't really matter how I feel. It's, it, I think that's how I'm read by other people. Um, but I also think, you know, growing up as in the, cl in the closet, you know, your identity, this dirty little secret, becomes this core negative part of your identity. And so when you come out, it's like, it's like a wind up toy. Every day you wind up this toy and then suddenly you come out and you let go. It's not like you can just exist. Suddenly this wind up toy has to keep going and going and going and, and your, your, your gayness starts to become a core part of your identity in a positive way. So you, it becomes very difficult not to talk about it. Um, plus, you know, it just, if someone asks me what I did last week, probably something will come up that necessitates me to mention my gayness. Like if, if it's not relevant to the conversation, I, I try not to mention it, but it just, it just naturally comes up in everything. Um, you know, um, my, so my, my parents were really proud of me for, for going onto TV um, and talking about my experience. Um, a lot of the other people on the show spoke a lot about the traumas and, and the, the, the really negative experiences they had, but I really tried to speak of unity and positivity and empathy. And uh, people from all around the world came, you know, sent me messages, some of them quite religious. Um, and they said to me, well, actually, well, one person from Mexico stands out to me. He said, um, you know, my entire life I felt so alone and so isolated. And I've tried to have a conversation with my parents, but, you know, and, and seeing this video and, and seeing, so there was a little excerpt on Facebook, which was watched by like 40,000 people or whatever it was. And he said, seeing 40,000 people all in support of this video, you know, it felt like there was an army of people behind me and supporting me and standing with me. And uh, I didn't feel quite so alone anymore. And I feel okay to have that conversation with my parents again. Um, and that's really the, the crux of it. You know, each of us, all of us have a deep desire to hold on to our Judaism. Um, but we also know that in some ways, Judaism will never be able to love us back quite as much. But still through it all, I've never lost my love for Judaism. And, uh, you know, I, I, if there is anything that, that, I can do personally to help facilitate that that connection, um, then then that's 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 what I can do. That's that that's great. Uh, there's no other words to say it. That's that's great. Um, I want to before we do throw to questions from those who are joining us today. There's one more question I would like to ask you. Um, if you could go back in time and sit down and talk to your 12 year old self based on what you know and what you've been through. Could I send him you... an almanac and be like, get <laughs> on these racehorses and then you'll be rich. 
Because <laughs> yes, money buys happiness, Jared. That's the here's, key. Here's the, here's the Powerball tickets. Good luck. No. Uh, <laughs> you wish. No, you can't do that. If you could go back in time and talk to your 12-year-old self based on everything that you've learned, done, and know now, what one piece of advice would you give yourself? Oh, wow. Um, Don't date the man at the gym. <laughs> uh, hey, look, I need to, I need to gain more muscles as well. Um, <laughs> I can't talk. Um, I would say, you know, Jared, you are Jewish. Jared, you are gay. Be proud to be Jewish. Be proud to be gay. Yes, there are some pieces of Judaism that you will never be able to do. Yes, there are some aspects of the gay community that you will never fully feel comfortable in, but there is enough, you know, there is enough Judaism to hold on to that don't let it go. Keep fighting, even if it's just a small slice of Judaism, even if it's just a fragment of Judaism, um, there is enough kindness and goodness and love and mishpacha within Judaism that don't let it go. Keep fighting. Good piece of advice. Um, well, thank, thank you so much for, for being so open and honest with your answers. Um, wish that everyone in the LGBT community, uh, regardless of faith, could be so open and, and transparent. You know what? We're getting there. Um, but it's great stories like yours that really, really inspire us to, you know, to come to terms with who we are, what we stand for and how to make the best of it. Um, if you do have questions, please send them through to me through chat uh, or to Alana as well, who is passing them uh, on to me as well. Um, Rachel from Melbourne. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. <laughs> says, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> Something stuck in my throat. Don't worry. It's not coronavirus. Um, have you watched Shit's Creek? And what do you think of it? <laughs> Shit's Creek. Oh, okay, okay. So I haven't seen it, but I saw a YouTube video of um, uh, of uh, I forgot the actor's name. There's a father and son um, Hollywood duo, and the son is in this show. Mm. Maybe someone can remind me. Um, but, uh, I, I Daniel Levy. That. Yeah. Daniel Levy. That's it. Uh, and, uh, thank you, Christopher from Auckland. Oh, thank you. Uh, could you read that in the New Zealander accent for us? Uh, thank you, Christopher from Auckland, <laughs> Daniel Levy. <laughs> Just don't ask me to do a South African accent. I'll, I'll offend everyone on here and everyone will leave. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so yeah, I saw a YouTube video, um, with the cast of Schitt's Creek and they, they read a letter from someone or people about how the, the, get the queer representation on the show. Um, I th uh, that's right. It was, the letter was from parents of queer people and the parents sent a combined letter to the cast saying that the show had a really profound impact on them and it helped them to understand their kids and it helped to repair that relationship and bring them together. Um, so I haven't seen the show, but I saw that and that really, um, made me fall in love with, with, uh, what the show is trying to do. Uh, is there anything that you're, I'm, I'm just going to throw a random question in there. Um, while, while we're here, um, any LGBT shows that you have seen or would recommend someone seeing if they're, if they're new to meeting LGBT members of our community? Uh, well, the, I mean, the one that comes to mind just from, you know, just from this year is Unorthodox, which mm. has been spoken about a lot. Um, Ober Tikkun Leil and Limud, I'm sure. Have you uh, watched it yourself? I have, yeah. I actually watched it on a date. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Was it a Zoom date? Did you share no, screens? A, actually a face-to-face -face one. Ah. We will talk after. This isn't a. Well, yeah, we'll talk. 
I need I need details. Uh, Jenny uh, Jenny has sent through a question as well. Um, how do you view reform Judea Judaism, given that you wouldn't need to be in conflict with your identity in this community? Um, yeah. It's just, yeah. I grew up modern Orthodox. I went to a Carmel school. I went to a modern Orthodox school for 12 years. I went to a sort of a modern Orthodox shul my entire life. And I may have issues, I may have questions, but ultimately that's, that's the Jewish experience I had growing up. You know, I, I had microaggressions a lot. I had anxieties a lot with, with certain things, but I don't know, there's still something that pulls me back. I, I would love my childhood rabbi to, to marry me. I know he never will, but that's still a goal of mine, funnily enough. You mean to marry you and your husband, not to marry you personally? No, 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 that, no. That's not your goal. <laughs> Sorry, he's not my type. Sorry, I'm just really long, straggly beards. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I have had the opportunity to be in reform, um, in the reform community. I think a lot of the time, the more secular, uh, liberal uh, reform parts of Judaism can be quite political, and that's not really a space I feel comfortable in. Um, but I have been to Temple Beth Israel. I've been to Colano. Uh, I went to Dianu in Sydney. Uh, I've had incredible experiences in that community, and I think it it um, it it's I think it's a a, a a wonderful piece of Judaism that more people should get to experience. And I, I wish that the Orthodox and um, Reform communities cross pollinated a bit more. Um, Christopher just asked, have you heard of gay Rabbi Stephen Greenberg, the Orthodox Rabbi? I have. I've actually got his book. I'll, uh, give me one <laughs> Jared, it doesn't really work when you leave the, the room. <laughs> <laughs> this is live television, people. <laughs> I like wearing kippahs because it hides your bald spot. So I have actually have his book. I'm reading it. Um, I was invited to uh, to help uh, Rabbi Greenberg to um, to chat uh, to to have a sort of Melbourne chat with maybe schools or with shuls or the local community um, about the the life that he's had and the messages he wants to send. So at the moment, I'm reading, and we'll we might have an update soon. Um, another okay. question for you, Jared. Yes. <laughs> What advice would you give to young adults in the Jewish community now who are still anxious about the repercussions of coming out? I'm sorry, can you say it again? What advice would you give to young, ad young adults in the Jewish community now who are still anxious about the repercussions of coming out? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, hey, look, it's not just young adults. I, I have had conversations with married people with you know people in their 60s and 70s who have only recently discovered their sexuality or their gender identity um you know there's there's a lot of as i said before when you are when you have a secret and you have a life you feel like you have to live then desire and disgust start to conflate mm -hmm. and particularly when you're discovering your own body and discovering other people's bodies with this anxiety and depression in your mind that can only lead to terrible things. Um, so, and I know people who have gotten married because they had to play the game they had to play the straight game. And, you know, because what other choice do they have in their minds? Um, I, I would say that whatever, whatever struggles you might think will happen if you come out, whether they are true, or whether they are accurate or not. And I honestly don't think they are really accurate in 2020, but whatever you might think might happen, if you choose to keep it a secret, if you choose to hold it in, if you choose to let that anxiety and depression and self-hatred um, be just a natural accepted part of your life, that has to be worse, surely. 
That would be my advice. Um, I, I, yeah, it's tough, but you know, each of us have our own journeys. Each of us have been through this on our own. You know, there was a time in my life where I felt there is not a single person in the entire universe who could possibly understand what I'm going through right now. And then you grow up. Mm -hmm. um, I had my first kiss and I realized, you know, oh, there's, there's another gay person in the universe. Maybe I'm not so alone. He was a smoker, so it wasn't a great kiss, but still. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so I would say we are all alone, but we are alone together. You know, if, if your family has, if you experience anti-Semitism, you can go to your family and your rabbi and your friends and your school and you can talk through it. You can have that support. If you experience homophobia, it could come from your family or your shul or your, fa or your friends or your school. Um, so, it, but there is a community of people out there who, um, who love you and who support you and, uh, and who embrace you and who, you know, I, okay, I will say this. When I came back to Melbourne after Argentina, I decided every time I meet a member of our community, I want to make the choice to offer them unconditional love. So if there are any queer people listening now, either live or recorded, I want to do that now. I see you, I see all of you, and I love you. You are a good person. You are worthy. You have been through hell and back, but you're here. You are a good person. You are a good person. You are a good person. That's, that's very powerful. Thank you, Jared, for, for sharing that. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I want to go to the Torah for a moment. Uh, and this, um, this is a, a question that came through. Um, you know, you, you read through the Torah, you read through, you know, as, as what's known as the, the Old Testament of the English Bible. Um, and everything has the same thing in common across religion is that I think homosexuality is the only sin that I can think of in the Torah where it's not, it doesn't say that it's punishable by death. Is that correct? Um, I did, a, I did a talk about this a while ago. If I remember it is, it is classified as a to ever an abomination. If I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. But it doesn't get owned if you're gay. <laughs> Which some people do, um, but uh, but yeah, no, I think it is. But the 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 Sanhedrin doesn't exist anymore, so no one can actually be tried. Which is good. <laughs> um, raise it. The qu the question from uh, from Rebecca is: What do you think about the commandment of the Torah about homosexuality? How do you feel towards Judaism with those statements? Um. Well, yeah, that's the crux of it. That's the question every single queer person spends their entire lives trying to answer. Um, you know, at, so I, I said at the very beginning, when we grew up, our lives weren't based on ticking every mitzvah box. You know, that wasn't the life that we led. And that's, that's, really, that's really how I live my life today. You know, I, I don't live my life you know, I, okay. I, I know people who do all the stuff, you know, they tick all the boxes, they do all the things in a very uh, a technical sense, but they aren't particularly pleasant people to be around. You know, there are people who, who, who focus on the journey without, who, who focus on the destination without the journey. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, you know, I, you know, maybe I don't keep to fill in. Maybe I don't do to fill in. Maybe I don't go to shul every week. Maybe I do have sex with men. Maybe these are things that are part of my life. But at the end of the day, I wake up every single morning trying to make the world a better place. And the values that I carry with me, you know, trying to be a good person. Um, 
having empathy for other people, curiosity of other people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't see my myself as a sin. It's not like, oh, it's a sin, but, but I can still be okay. No, I, no, I, that's not a good way to live life. But if you did, if you are a person who considers homosexuality as a sin every second, every moment of your life, um, yeah. then remember that it's not about the things it's about, it's not, it's not about the stuff, you know, it's about the values that drive us to do what we do. And, um, so that's, that's my answer, I guess. Um, we got one final question and, uh, <laughs> directed the question to me, if that's okay. What advice would you give to parents when their kids come out to them? Um, you know, I, when, when I first came out, I was living in the US and I thought the best way to tell my parents was being over 24 hours away from Australia. So if they did have a problem with that, then, you know, it's only six hours to Europe and you can hide in Europe. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I've, I've had the privilege as, a, as someone in business um, and jo journalism as well to, to know and mentor a lot of young LGBT uh, journalists, um, one being um, a Channel 9, uh, someone who's on Channel 9 at the moment on A Current Affair, 60 Minutes and, um, and Nine News as well, who started off, I used to um, produce uh, a current affairs show um, called In the Spotlight, where we actually looked at how it was like um, a version of Q&A, uh, but for radio. And, um, you know, I've had the privilege to, to meet and talk with a lot of LGBT youth, even though I'm 34. Uh, people look, look at me as like the gay big brother and I'm like, well, that's a really bad TV show because we know how that would end up. Um, <laughs> there was that show, uh, Finding Prince Charming, which was, uh, which was a disaster. <laughs> it was a disaster, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess the best advice that I would have, I mean, if I, I think the, the biggest piece of advice is that it's not about you. A lot of, a lot of parents and of course, under understandably um kind of goes oh my goodness how can this happen my son's my son's gay my daughter's gay my my child is wants to become trans you know this is this is horrible you know i've they got to think about to become trans they've always been trans and now they've come out as trans just rightly so no no yeah rightly so my biggest piece of advice is that it's not about you it's it's about the person who you've given birth to. It's about the person who you love and care about each and every day. Um, a struggle with sexuality, whether, whether you're like Jared, who, you know, obviously had to fight a big internal battle or whether you just came out with, you know, sparkles and rainbows and unicorns and said, I'm gay. And your parents went, well, tell me what else is new. Um, which is kind of what my parents did, which was really frustrating. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, when, when you're talking about it in your head for so long and then your parents go, yeah. And, and you're like, I was kind of hoping that there'd be some conflict because you've built it all up in your head. And now yeah. it's just like, it's like a deflated balloon. Um, so sure. best advice is it's not about you just, you know, be, be a, be a parent. It's it, your kid looks up to you for, for love and for guidance. And if you're thinking about yourself and how it affects you, I think you've missed, you're missing a, a, a big opportunity to actually be the positive, the role model, the, the carer in your child's life. Hmm. Um, and on that note, I'm going to jump in and just say thank you again to both Adam for being a fantastic moderator and Jared for being so honest and raw in your emotions and throwing in a lot of humour in there as well. Um, if everyone would like to join me in acknowledging them by using the clap or the thumbs up button and the reactions um, tab, just to say thank you once again to everyone. Um, Susan made a comment before and she asked me to read it out. I think, Jared, in relation to your comment about hoping that your rabbi would one day be able to marry you and your partner, not marry you, and you said, oh, maybe not. And her comment, which I can relate to, is um, last night that one of the speakers at Lingwood was Rabbi Judith Levitin, who was Melbourne's first 
female ordained Orthodox rabbi. So 10 years ago, we would have never thought that would happen. So you never know. Um, but thank you again, once again, um, to everyone for participating, for your questions. Um, this is the end of the morning session, but make sure to tune in again to Linwood this afternoon. And thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Alana. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Alana. And thanks, everyone. No problem.